Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship this morning. It's good to have you all with us and uh, delighted to be able to worship with you uh, this morning. Before we begin, just a reminder that after worship at the conclusion, we'll have a short church conference on Zoom only for our uh, election of our officers and committee members for the coming year. And then we will have our uh, virtual coffee hour after that. So we would love to have you join us for that, uh, if, you, if at all possible. Um, the document for that also was sent to uh, late last night. Um, so if you'd like to do that before the meeting or, or to grab that at some point, you certainly feel free to do so. All right. I would invite you, you can read it aloud or, or follow along as I lead us in our call to worship this morning. Strength is commanding the wind and sea to obey. Strength is wielding a slingshot in the face of a raging giant. Strength is accepting vulnerability from inside the boat. Strength is standing in solidarity with the powerless. Strength is turning a cheek. Strength is loving an enemy. We come to worship a God who, who redefines our vision of strength. So we sing of one version of that vision as we uh, hear our opening hymn. And again, I invite you to follow along if, and sing or follow as you would like. It's give to the winds thy fears. I invite you to join with me, or actually to just follow along in your hearts as we join together in our opening prayer. Let us pray. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold too in times of trouble. Those who know your name, O Lord, put their trust in you, for you have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord, who dwells in Zion, declare his deeds among the peoples. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. And be gracious to us, O Lord. You are the one who lifts us up, so that we may recount all your praises and rejoice in your deliverance. All this we ask in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. We have three scriptures this morning, and uh, the first two continue in our progression of stories through the scriptures as we uh, explore today the stories of Samuel and David. You will remember that Samuel was uh, really a, a, a transition figure, a transitional character between the time of the judges and the beginning of the time of the kings. Really, the first, uh, or at a time when he was really the only person who was speaking an authoritative word from God. Uh, eventually this leads us to Saul and then to King David. I will also have a passage from Corinthians in a little while. Our liturgist today is Friedrich Wilcox. Our first scripture reading today comes from 1 Samuel and is entitled Samuel's Calling and Prophetic Activity. 
Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Our uh, special music today is a piece that Althea Wilcox put together for you. And she chose this, this particular hymn because of its connection to Samuel. And her, the title of it, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing. Our second reading today comes to us also from Samuel. We skipped ahead a few chapters to the famous story of David and Goliath. Our second reading is also from 1 Samuel and is the story of David and Goliath. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of that coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had greaves of bronze on his legs, a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spar's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield-bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, Today I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. 
Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper, took the provisions, and went as Jesse had commanded him. He came to the encampment as the army was going forth to the battle line, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. David left the things and charged the keeper of the baggage, ran to the ranks, and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. David said to Saul, Let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are just a boy and he has been a warrior since his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb for the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a cloak of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I am not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took the staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David, with his shield-bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog? Do you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly might know that the Lord does not save by the sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine drew nearer to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put a stone in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. Every uh, June at our church, we honor our graduates uh, who have completed their course of study. We also, as well, have scholarships to, reward, uh, to award. These are funds and monies that have been set aside as memorial gifts, in many cases, or family gifts in honor and memory of loved ones and for the benefit of students who are going on to continue their education. Normally they would come to us and, uh, and uh, we would welcome them in our sanctuary. And of course that's not possible in the current conditions, uh, but uh, Jocelyn Langworthy and Bobby Pelletier visited these students over this past week. And we have a, a video to show you uh, with those presentations.
each of our uh, graduates, uh, you may have been able to see in the picture, not only received a, uh, a certificate of recognition, but in addition, they received a, a prayer scarf. Each year, our prayer shawl ministry knits prayer, scar prayer scarves for our graduating seniors. And, um, and we present those as well. And as you saw, as they went by the, the various uh, winners of our scholarships as well, a big congratulations to all of our seniors um, and all those who've completed uh, programs of study. It's uh, certainly a lot of work and uh, we congratulate you and our prayers go with you. We hope that you will uh, remember whether it's your church or we hope you'll find a, a church home in your new community where your, uh, where your school is. And remember to continue to grow in your faith uh, as you continue your pursuits uh, in these new and exciting ways. Let us have a word of a prayer for our graduates. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for all the ways that we can use our gifts in this world, and especially today, for the gifts of our minds, and in many cases, our whole selves, uh, as we have studied and watched these uh, men and women grow, or, uh, grow up right before our eyes in many cases, who have uh, experienced, and especially this year, endured so much to complete their work and to make their plans for the days ahead. That we cannot guarantee what the future will hold, but we know that you will be there with them uh, each and every step of the way. We pray that your blessings will be felt by these students as they variously continue their studies or take a year off or uh, look to various vocations. Help them to feel your presence, to know your grace, and to respond in love to all that they may know. Help them to continue to build their gifts and their skills that in what they do, they will be able to continue to serve you and serve this world as so many have already ably demonstrated. Uh, in all the ways they have given of themselves for their community and for their world. The prayers of their church go with them, and we pray that with your help, they will continue to grow in faith and spirit and knowledge and strength and wisdom and be beacons for you and alongside you in all of the weeks and months and years to come. We congratulate them on their successes and look forward to what the future holds in store. And our prayers continue to go with them now and always through Jesus and our advocate, the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have one more scripture and Frederick will read that one for us as well. Our last reading this morning is from 2 Corinthians, in a letter from Paul. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, At an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way, through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, bearing, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well unknown, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children. Open wide your hearts also. 
My message this morning is called, They Might Be Giants. And you might take that one of several ways. It's a title of a uh, the name of a movie. Um, it's a phrase that sometimes people use. But anyway, they might be giants. The stories of Samuel and David and Goliath. First, though, would you please pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. It's an activity that not many of us have been able to do uh, in recent months, some not at all, some very cautiously, some only recently, and that is uh, to eat out, to go to your favorite restaurant or your favorite uh, coffee shop, or to stop at a place you like to get a bite to eat, whether it's uh, after a day of work or to gather with friends or, or to spend some time uh, in a different setting or scene. It's long been known, although probably not something we think too much about, that uh, when it comes to food safety, there is some additional risk of eating out, uh, foodborne in illnesses in particular. Um, and it's really hard and it's often in a, in, a, uh, in a busy atmosphere to catch all the, the bugs and such, so to speak, that might be present. And this was true long before uh, COVID-19. In the industry, sometimes they will use what they call or, or seek what they call a, a kill step. That is to say, what is it they can do to take the, the most uh, action or the strongest steps to make sure of the safety of their patrons? One really good illustration of this was in 2015. Um, some of you have probably eaten at Chipotle. It's a Mexican restaurant chain. Uh, and they had a particularly bad outbreak. Uh, 55 customers in 11 states uh, ended up with E. coli. Um, and then in Boston, there was another outbreak of norovirus that sickened uh, 80 customers just at a single store. So you can imagine when these things happen, uh, it hurt the uh, reputation and the profitability of Chipotle. But they did something that was not altogether uh, known at the time, although certainly many companies will, will uh, take significant steps to try to avoid, obviously, such a, a repeat. But they had a particularly public response. They decided to hire some food safety experts and some people who were knowledgeable about how uh, diseases spread and how to keep a food supply safe. They developed a system that but their food suppliers as well. They uh, and looked for particular ways where they could destroy the harmful bacteria before it arrived on your plate when you ordered it. Uh, among the steps they had was a new way of cooking their beef, which not only vacuum sealed it, but gave it a steam bath before shipping it using high pressure to keep and to reduce the growth of any bacteria that might have survived survive the cooking process. Uh, blanching vegetables before cooking them, which is, uh, if you blanch them, many of you know it's boiling them, usually for about five seconds or so. Um, they improve the air, purify, uh, par the air purification systems to cut down on airborne bacteria. They change how they clean their countertops. Uh, but most importantly, they really worked with their employees. Um, they added paid sick days so that employees who normally could not afford to miss a day didn't feel pressure to come in when they were not well. Um, they developed ways of helping each other uh, identify signs of illness and uh, sickness. Rather than a single uh, kill step, as the industry might think of it, they had developed several different strategies that have helped the company regain a lot of its reputation and its customer base. This kind of uh, concern might be front of mind as some of you have either begun to eat out again or perhaps have thought, is that something I could safely do? Is there some 
way even just to get out for a short time that I could could do that so I could meet a friend. Uh, you'll come to different conclusions about whether that is um, something that you can or can't do. But this whole idea of a, of a kill step is not just something we can apply to food. Um, it's also something we can think about in terms of potentially hazardous problems or issues in the rest of our life. That is to say, what extra preparation or what extra steps can we make or take that will help us so that if we are confronted by a difficult situation, if we are confronted by a particularly upset person having a really bad day, or maybe somebody who is a part of our life that is just always like that, or those situations that pop up in our lives from time to time where, where we feel really upset or sick to our stomach, or sometimes literally, or at least in our mind, uh, feel very conflicted, even angry about the situation that is before us. How could we deal with those in a healthier way, in ways that don't consume us, or uh, ways that don't deeply affect us and our ability even to function on a day-to-day -day level? One person that had this, well, actually two people that had this approach uh, really were in Samuel and David. And uh, Samuel, is really an interesting figure. And I, I found it interesting in the scripture, I don't know if you caught it um, in the first reading that Friedrich had for us today, where he really talked about this uh, time in it when God was not known to be speaking a whole lot to the people of that day. I really found that to be interesting. The way the scripture says it, and the way my experience is don't quite seem to match. As I've looked at that more closely, I've wondered, was it that it was really not God who was speaking to people? Or was it just that people were having a hard time listening? Even Samuel's father, Eli, if you go on from the story that's, that Friedrich read today, uh, is to be punished because although he was attuned to the voice of God, he didn't always follow what God had in mind. In fact, the first things that God had to say to Samuel were about the consequences that his own father was going to suffer. But rather than turn the voice aside or to stop listening because it was his father or a subject that was uncomfortable, Samuel kept listening and he kept responding. Eventually it was out of, uh, out of Samuel that people began to trust that he really did have uh, the ear of God and he could really understand and discern and communicate what God was trying to say. Eventually that led to Saul, um, although even God himself regretted, uh, regretted that uh, choice. And that brought us to David, a David who appears in the second, uh, the second scripture, and he arrives at a time of increasing conflict between the, uh, the Hebrew people and the Philistines. And they had this huge, huge man uh, named Goliath. I mean, try to imagine uh, the biggest potential, the biggest person that you have ever, ever seen, and then bulk him up or her, add a few feet to the height, uh, put on armor, and then add to that a reputation that was, this is somebody who could not be defeated. You can imagine how terrifying that might have looked to see him uh, coming out of the valley with the army, uh, this imposing, uh, imposing figure. Um, it was not the kind of person that anyone wanted to face, and most certainly not one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, King Saul certainly did not offer his services to go and fight him directly. But it took then a, a different person, really, to uh, address this head on. Somebody who had this um, kill step idea of how to deal with a problem. This is David, who um, our best guess is was probably a teenager at this time. And um, 
uh, might not have even been old enough, certainly in our time would not have been old enough to drive probably or uh, go to a bar, probably was not old enough to even suit up with those fighting uh, the Philistines. Well, you know how the story goes from there. Uh, he'll go out to meet Goliath with his five stones in his sling and with one shot literally applies the kill step. He takes Goliath out and now suddenly the Philistines are far less confident. Most people would have looked at that situation and figured there was no way, no possible hope. But that's not how it was for David. David not only was able to identify the problem, but he was able to identify it clearly. Sometimes we think we know the problem. Um, and we really don't. Many people would have looked at Goliath and said, well, the problem is we can't defeat Goliath. And David didn't accept that premise and looked, uh, looked for another way. He thought about his own skills and abilities. He thought about his opponent's potential vulnerabilities. Just like the people at uh, Chipotle who decided they could, that they had, well, they had choices. They could spin uh, the situation potentially and make it sound like there was no problem. They could assure people that they were taking steps to address it, but not actually do anything meaningful. Or they could really take a significant uh, action, in this case, several significant actions that would fundamentally change how they function as a, as a company. Often when we look at problems, we either make it much bigger than it really needs to be. I know that's a, an issue that I will often do. Uh, instead of looking at it in much more manageable pieces. Um, sometimes we let it grow in our minds when maybe the solution is much more about dealing with our own fears, whether it's fear of change or our fear of loss of control or our fear of, I don't know what's coming next, uh, our fear of the unknown, uh, our fear of failure, whatever your fear is so often, the problem at hand isn't really the deepest problem, but underneath it is some kind of fear. What fear do we have to get a handle on? Whether it's something that pushes our proverbial buttons or whatever it is that causes that fear for you. But what is it that makes you tremble, that makes you worried, that scares you? David, it would seem, looked at Goliath not as a problem, but as an opportunity. And in doing so, not just for his own uh, reputation as a, as a warrior, but also to lift up God as well. He drew on his experience. And all those years of attending the flocks meant that he had uh, understood what it was like to work with stones and slings. He had skills that the average person didn't have. He didn't necessarily know how to throw a spear or put on a, a, a suit of armor, that he had other skills and they came in very useful. So often we forget about what we're good at. One of the interesting things over this time of the pandemic is people looking inside themselves and saying, what is it that I can do? What is it that I can offer? So for some that means they, they're really good at making food. So they deliver food to people in need. Uh, one I was recently reminded of, and I, and I uh, put in this coming, uh, forthcoming newsletter, um, our district superintendents have said, you know, we could write a prayer every day, along with some other people in the conference. We could write a prayer every day and have those put out uh, each day so people have uh, a spiritual resource to draw on uh, in this time of challenge. Uh, other people have have time and vehicles that they can shuttle people back and forth uh, who might not have the means to get to appointments. Uh, and I mean, the list goes on. When you look at the world today, you can see enormous problems that seem intractable and uh, almost impossible to get over, but you also might see an opportunity 
you know, when we first started doing services like this online, the first thought I think so many of us had was, how are we going to keep people connected? That's an ongoing challenge in several ways. But not many of us were talking about the people who would be able to join us online that couldn't join us in person because, um, because they could not leave their house or because of their distance away from the church or um, because they weren't sure that they could step into the church um, and try something new where it was a lot easier to do in an online setting. Sometimes we have to change that paradigm. What paradigm are you drawing on? What pieces are superfluous? What voices do you hear that tell you you can't do it, or it's not possible, or there's no way that'll work? It's certainly the message David heard, um, but he found ways to make it work. There's certainly no shortage of negativity in our world today. How do you, when you hear that negativity, how do you respond? A lot of times negativity begets more negativity. But you can also look and see the positive that has emerged. That's why I always encourage you, one reason I always encourage you, to look for how God is at work. It's one reason we've been having, uh, as often as we can, a joy moment, to see that even when we're challenged, there is still much to celebrate in the human spirit, in the human response, and especially in God's work. There's a couple of other pieces I wanna to just touch on. Um, as always, there's so much, these are such rich passages and I would encourage you to go back and, and, uh, and soak them in a little bit, but a couple other pieces that I would like to, to uh, briefly touch on as well. Um, one thing we see here in these passages is the struggle to listen to God. As I mentioned before, I think the fact that Samuel seemed to be the only one that was able to hear the voice of God at that point in time, at least in part suggests that it may have been people were really getting distant from God. So often the apparent lack of God's work in our world is anything but, and much more likely to be an indicator of our uh, dissolving or disappearing or even absent connection with God. How do you put yourself in places to listen to God? And then even when you do, how do you keep in that place? One of the things that comes in David's story later that we know, you know, we hear of his triumph with Goliath. We know he's in tune with God. He becomes king. But then as king, uh, he doesn't always follow God's ways. He uh, assaulted another woman. He was not always honest. Uh, he did not always follow what God would have wanted. Even when we are normally in a place, in a position to follow God, and we do maybe most of the time or we think all the time, it's not always easy to stop, to, to continue rather, to continue to follow in God's ways. Even for kings, that was a struggle. So I think God can understand how it can be for us. His encouragement is to really keep ourselves focused and to realize that when we are challenged, there are often resources beyond which might be usual. That's what David was really able to do in using his gifts. This, by the way, is how, or one way you can think of how the least of these that the gospel talks about are able to achieve a connection with the kingdom of God. They may not have resources the way the world thinks of them, but they often have spiritual resources and also a resourcefulness from their life's experience that goes beyond traditional definitions and categories. Many of you have come to your faith in less than traditional ways, or have been able to sustain your faith in less than traditional ways because you've drawn from your experience, and you've drawn from your giftedness, and you've drawn from the unique combination of peoples that are part of this particular congregation or this particular community or your particular life. There's not a cookbook for faith. It's simple on one hand and yet profound on the other. 
You cannot say if you follow these 20 steps, you will have a, a fulfilled life of faith forever and always. I can say that if you're willing to honestly look at yourself and see, identify what you have to offer, God is there in the midst of that process, and God will walk with you as you use those gifts. And especially if you hear negative thoughts and energies about how you can't possibly achieve this or possibly achieve that. You can only imagine that some of our graduates today have heard those words in different ways. Well, you couldn't possibly do that, or uh, that just will never work. Like, if not all, most could tell stories of how, in fact, they did overcome those doubts, whether within themselves or beyond, uh, to achieve what they have accomplished. Then finally today, our passage from Corinthians. As we go through this, this series, I'd like to at least occasionally bring in these passages uh, from other places in Scripture, in part because there's no way, uh, even in the course of a year, that we can cover everything that there is to possibly cover. And Paul, as he is in, in um, Corinth, is realizing that something is amiss, that uh, part of it is that not everybody has respected Paul's work. Um, and yet, even when he knows that everyone is working towards exactly the same ends, some in fact are calling themselves uh, the person to follow, even at the expense of Christ. Uh, Paul focuses on the grace of God, the significance of accepting the grace of God, not for vain purposes, um, not to lift up ourselves, but to lift up God. It's in this passage that Paul gives this list that can seem almost terrifying, this list of, of, uh, of very difficult situations that people find themselves in, whether uh, beatings, imprisonments, labors, hunger, sleepless nights, uh, calamities, afflictions, so goes the list. But even when those happen to us, through our focus on God, the, the power of God, the love of God, the holiness of spirit of God, uh, by practicing purity and kindness and patience and knowledge, not in a naive kind of way, not in a head in the sand kind of way, but in a get in the middle of life kind of way, using the skills we have, uh, being bolstered, encouraged by God, knowing that those deserving of God's grace are really none of us, whether in fact we are of ill or good repute, thought of as being true or, or imposters, as the scripture says, whether known or not, whether at the beginning of life or the end of the life, or whatever it is, God still offers that same gift of grace no matter what. To the Hebrew people, it took, in part, that day with David uh, defeating Goliath, that kind of event to remind them of just how significant it was, or can, can be, for someone who no one gives a chance to come out on top. There's a reason we often use that phrase, uh, David and Goliath, in everyday uh, speech and language. We love an underdog. And we love to see someone succeed who we didn't think had a, had a chance. We define grace by the way the world defines it. None of us would have a chance either. We would be underdogs to be deserving the kind of grace that we have. And yet God gives that anyway. God pours upon, upon us, each and every one, that same measure of grace given freely because God loves us that much and wants so much to see us realize not only our potential as individuals, but our potential as a community of faith and as societies in this world where faith and fairness 
and uh, abundance and joy define human existence. And we can do that. We can be there. If we can keep our focus on God. There's a warning in the experiences of Samuel and David in different ways to be sure uh, about what can happen if we can't keep that focus. But when we can, God will, uh, through the Holy Spirit, our advocate, lead us into amazing places if we just give God that opportunity. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we thank you for all the gifts you do give us. Sometimes when the Goliaths of life appear, we may think we only have a few stones. What good could they possibly do? And yet you uh, so often give us great power because of our life experiences, because of our individual abilities, and especially because of what we can do together that would not ever be possible on our own. Help us to have confidence in what you've given and to see around us the opportunities, not just the problems, not just the absence of you. Help us to have confidence in your promises and confidence in your active grace working in us and through us and among us and all your people, including in people that don't even know that grace is there with them and among them and for them. Might it be that we can open eyes to the work of that grace in the lives of everyone we know, sometimes through the words we speak, and we pray with your help, often with the lives that we lead. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For our joy moment this morning, I am pleased to have with us Ruth Ann Weeks, who is going to share an experience of uh, God's grace in our world and in her life or in her life experience. And um, whenever you're ready, Ruth Ann, just uh, make sure you unmute yourself. Okay. You do. I did that. I hope everybody can hear me. Working at the Caribou Food Pantry fills my heart with happiness and joy every day I'm there in the world. I'm only, we're doing curbside delivery by appointment only. We've asked all of our clients to wear face coverings. We have never had a complaint from anybody. If somebody doesn't have one, we're happy to provide them a face covering for them because we do interact with them to a degree. Uh, I'm gonna share a couple moments with you. Catholic Charities has been very kind to us and a couple weeks ago, we received 20 gallons of fresh milk. We called our families that have young children to see if they could use milk. Of course they could. One family that's been with our pantry since before I started volunteering, which was probably four or five years ago, comes, continues to come to our pantry. They're a family of six children and two adults. The children range from one year old to 20. The 20 year old is a college student, but of course they're all home and they've been home since March, all of the children. So dad came in to pick up the milk and we gave him a few gallons of milk and he said, thank you. He said, I went to the store on Sunday to get milk and all I could afford was a pint. Now can you imagine how far a pint of milk went with six children? So he took the milk and went home and a few minutes, few, maybe half an hour, an hour later, I got a text from mom and she said, thank you so much. We are so grateful. That just, makes me explode with joy. Another case was a gentleman that called us, newly unemployed, said to us, I've never been to a food pantry in my life. I am so embarrassed. We said, don't be embarrassed. That's what we're here for. He came in. We provided him with enough food for his family for a couple of weeks. He went home and called back later after he unpacked his food and said to us, Thank you. My children will have dinner tonight. I can't tell you how good that makes us feel, makes me feel as an individual to be able to provide food to people who have food insecurity. We're not seeing a lot of unemployed people now. We are seeing two or three new people every time we're open. 
our seniors have ex have really exploded. The seniors are struggling. I think when the six hundred dollars per week from the CARES program is no longer part of the unemployment in Maine, we will see a significant increase in the unemployed in this people or the underemployed in this area. And we're we're able to do that. We have adequate food. And so we're looking forward to be able to provide more food. Our numbers have gone up in the last two weeks. We were serving maybe eight or 10 a week. We're now up to 18 to 21, twice a week. So we are seeing an, an increase. Every time we're open, it is a joy for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth Ann. That was really good. You're welcome. It makes me think how, um, I know uh, I've been guilty sometimes of, of making judgments of people without really understanding what's going on in their lives. And uh, um, sometimes I think that's kept us as Christians from acting uh, in, in everyday ways like that that make such a difference. So uh, it's really good for us to hear those uh, examples. So we come to our time of prayer. Um, I do have, uh, a number of prayer requests, and then I would, uh, if you have others that you would like to offer, certainly feel free to do that, uh, to offer those as well. If you would keep the following persons in your prayers. Prayers, please, for Debbie and Lou Sharp, Darlene Nelder, Sheila Bellier, Dave and Marcia DeMerchant, Bob Sear, Emily Robin and James Stewart, Phyllis Sykes, Leona Mishu, for Glenn Taggett, Megan Lombard, Dave Corvo, for George and Joyce Noor, Richard and Susan Clark, for Clark Duty, that's the son of Ken Duty's cousin, and for Mary. I'm sorry, for Gary and Marilyn Langley, and for Jerry Dare. Are there others that you would like to have lifted up this morning? Prayers for Ruth Hare. For Ruth Dare? Ruth Hare. Hair, I'm sorry, Ruth Hare. We'll keep Ruth Hare in our prayers. Please pray for my father, Herman Wright, who is struggling with health issues. Let's continue prayers for Herman Wright as he uh, struggles with various health issues. For Emily Dyer. Ongoing prayers for Emily Dyer and her family. If there are no others, then let us uh, join once more in a spirit of prayer. Holy God, we are grateful that you have heard our prayers, those that we have spoken and those that we have prayed in our hearts. We so much want to respond to your initiative, but we confess that sometimes we have, we have fears or we are uncertain of what the best thing to do is. We don't always know, even if that, that impulse we have in our mind is just our own mind or if it's you. Oh, author of our lives, on any given day or any given moment, we are ready to say to you, here I am. But there are moments when we wonder, how long, O oh Lord? And other moments when we are assured, you will provide. There are moments when we feel forgotten by you and other moments when we are blessed by your steadfast gift of love forever and ever. There are moments when we feel pain and sorrow and other moments when we feel set free. There are moments when we feel shaken by the powers around us and other moments when we are revived by grace 
like one who receives a cup of cold water in the heat of the day. There are moments of darkness and death and other moments of light and life. O oh, author of our lives, on any given day, at any given moment, we are ready to say to you, here I am. Thank you for already knowing, forgiving, and accompanying us through all of the other moments as our story unfolds in your keeping. We cannot wait for the next chapter. The title of that chapter is Welcome. So we pray all this in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So I'd like to take just a few moments for some announcements. We have uh, a couple of events coming up that I would like you to note. One is this, uh, not this week, but the 7th of July is our town hall meeting. You uh, either have or should shortly receive a letter from the reentry re task group. And I want to clarify one piece from some questions I've had this week. Um, the way we put the material together is to say, if we were to reopen the church, this is what worship would look like. Or uh, if we were to have worship again in our sanctuary, these are the conditions under which this would look like from based on the information we know at least at the present. And then given that information, would you, for example, would you uh, attend or not? Uh, and so forth in the, the questions. So in a sense, it's a, trying to give you an idea of what it would look like and then have feedback on um, how, you, how you would want to worship uh, given that information. Uh, later this week, there will be, uh, at the end of the week, the, uh, the full plan will be sent out to everyone so that you can have that for that town hall. The newsletter will have the Zoom link in it. I will also include that uh, as well in an email out to you later this week. Uh, so do look for that. Uh, if you're not able to attend that night, uh, my hope is that we can either have it recorded and posted so that you can uh, watch that or at least have, a, uh, have an opportunity for a team member to contact you if you would like to talk with them. Uh, but we would really like you to, to complete that survey. It'll really help the team understand what, where there is support for particular actions um, or choices that we have to make. July 26th is another date. We plan to have an outdoor service uh, around the church garden, just to the north of the parsonage. Um, I'm told that I will be planted, so to speak, in the garden. <laughs> and um, we'll invite people to come and uh, we will ask that if you would observe uh, social distancing and related uh, guidelines. Um, as you set up your chairs around and the worship committee still has some details to work out of how exactly we'll set up uh, for that service. Um, if weather is not good that day, uh, the following Sunday will be a rain date. Uh, so look for more information on that. I also uh, put out a note this la uh, last night uh, looking for some input on my Thursday devotion this week. Uh, in a sentence or two, if you have a, uh, a definition of freedom as a, as a Christian person uh, living in this world and in this country, what would you say that is in a sentence or two? Uh, I'd love to have that in a, a short audio file, maybe from your phone or your computer that you email to me, or you can write it down and I'll, uh, I don't necessarily have to have a name, uh, but would love to have some of those in an opening part of that devotion for this week. Uh, do have those in by Tuesday, if you would, please. Um, are there other announcements to be made today? Pastor Tim? Yes. We are, we put out the Facebook post this week about um, 
Vacation Bible School in a box. Um, and the registration form is on our Facebook page. I'm not sure. Elena, have you gotten any registrations back yet? I haven't received any. <laughs> I think I directed them to be sent to the church by mail or to the church email address. Okay. Um, but if you know anybody that would benefit from that outreach, certainly um, please let us know, get them registered. Um, and we're still in the planning phases of that, probably for early August at this point. Thank you, Jocelyn. And uh, anyone else with an announcement? So I will turn to our offering next. And again, a, a huge thank you. Uh, so many of you have uh, been able to continue to send in your offerings and to continue to make our ministries possible. Um, huge, huge thank you. If uh, you have wanted to contribute but don't know how to do so, you can use one of the methods on your screen or contact Tamara Wilcox for more information. Um, even though you're, uh, we don't have a plate to put them in today, I, it's still important, I think, to dedicate all that we offer to God. And so I uh, ask that we do that now as we thank God for the gifts we've given. God, you are the giver of all wonders and good gifts in this world, and we thank you that you have abundantly blessed us, even when we have not always been aware or paid attention. But help us focus in on you now to realize whether it's five smooth stones in our pocket, uh, a couple of dollars in our wallet, a couple of minutes on our calendar, an inspiration in our mind and so many other gifts and skills that you have given us, whatever they may be, even when they don't seem like they're that significant, what a difference you can make with them. We thank you for the difference you make in this community of faith and wider community. And we pray that we will continue to steward well the gifts you have given. All this we ask in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Uh, following our closing hymn and benediction and the postlude, we will reconvene for our church conference. I don't expect it to be uh, more than five or ten minutes, and then we'll have a ta uh, coffee hour fellowship after that. Um, so I invite you for those as well. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn 671. If you have a United Methodist hymnal, it's Lord, dismiss us with thy blessing. Now let us go into the world 
convinced of God's presence in it, convinced of God's activity in it, convinced that God can use us, even us, even what we have, to make a big difference facing the very real challenges of this world, seeing them as opportunities for ministry and opportunities for making the grace of God known. So go with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go with the love of God. Go with the communion of the Holy Spirit. Now and for always. Amen.